faces, you that are here, and you that are clicking on out of Facebook, and you can see it on YouTube. If you would, please, touch the share button and share this message today with someone you know, uh, perhaps someone you're friends with on Facebook. But every week, the Lord is encouraging us with different things for this coming year. We're in 2023 of full steam, and so I'm looking for to be totally free in 2023, what he's got planned and purpose. At 1.30 at 1628 Lakewood Drive in Brandon, this is our temporary location, and we go on Facebook Live every Sunday at 2.15. But we'd like to have you join us. But If you're attending another church, we don't want you to do that, or not to leave that church, but you can go to their morning service and come to our afternoon service. Now, I know that's a lot of church for some people, but the days that we're in, we need to draw closer than what we have ever been in our lifetime. What is on the horizon, actually on the threshold of where we are, it could be frightening if someone doesn't know the Lord. I was talking about this last night, that I'm not afraid of death. I've faced it for so many times and so many years, but I meet believers And I meet pastors, bishops, that are afraid of death. There's nothing to be afraid of. In an instant, you transition from this life into eternal life to be with the Lord forever. And that's what we're looking for. Now, before I get into the message, I'm going to ask Dr. Patricia to come. We haven't done this in a while. We want to pray over Israel and also especially over our great nation. So get in agreement with her. Thank you, Archbishop. Good afternoon. <coughs> it's good to be here once again in the house of the Lord. And today, I want to emphasize how important prayer is. Oh, please dismiss the children. We forgot that. So sorry. Children, be dismissed. Thank you. Um, <coughs> We're going to speak to our economy in the United States today. Yes. In Matthew 16, 18, Yeshua said, Yeshua is the uh, Hebrew name for Jesus, which I prefer to use. Yeshua said, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell, actually it says Hades, the gates of Hades shall not prevail. Together, they existed to govern. They voted, they ruled, and they made the laws. Whatever they said went. And in the kingdom of God, Messiah's church is also a governing and legislating body. Whatever we say there also goes. This applies to the nations as well. And it applies to our nation For we are a church, the governing body of God's people, who can assemble together to bind and loose and cast down and raise up. In our nation today, we are facing an extreme problem that needs to be bound. That problem is called inflation, and it appears to be exploding. But guess what? This inflation that appears to be out of control is not out of control at all because we, as God's people, have control in the spirit realm. Yes. God bows to no man. There is not enough power of darkness in all the earth to keep him from moving as we pray. We're going to pray and make some declarations. Those of you watching and those of you here, I would appreciate your agreeing with me with these declarations. And if you want to say them out loud, you can do that as well. Father God, in Yeshua's name, we thank you where two or more agree as touching anything, it shall be done for us. 
We praise you for your word is good and your mercy endures forever. Abba Father, we take up our authority that you have given us today. And with the authority you have vested in us as your ecclesia, your ruling body, we speak against inflation and we bind it. In the mighty name of Yeshua, the Messiah, we decree and declare that no weapon formed against the United States of America may prosper. Amen. Every tongue that rises against her, we shall show to be in the wrong. We bind inflation and forbid it to continue. We speak a healthy amount of deflation to the price of goods. We decree and declare that the government, the Fed, and the powers that be on the earth must take holy and righteous steps now to curb inflation and bring our economy back to health. We command the supply chain to open and stabilize. We declare profits into the retirement accounts of all God's people. Prices of so consumer goods, we speak to you and command, command you to normalize, stabilize, and return to the help and vigor that will benefit all Americans in Yeshua's name. Yes. Abba Father, your word says in Psalms 35, 27, let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. Yes. Your word says that you take pleasure in the prosperity of your servants. In these current economic circumstances that have been thrust upon us by wicked people, we are not prospering at this moment. We're struggling instead. Nevertheless, your word says that your people shall never be put to shame. Therefore, Father, we ask you in Yeshua's name to take up our cause and enforce these declarations that we have made today. We ask that you go out with your mighty hand and outstretched arm and cast down inflation and restore us to prosperity and do for us all the things that make your heart glad. Thank you, Father. We serve at your pleasure and we thank you for giving us the power to bind inflation and loose prosperity. For these things which have been bound on earth are already bound in heaven. Yes. You do not tolerate wickedness, control, or poverty in your heaven, and neither shall we on earth. You have riches, glory, honor, provision, and plenty in heaven. And so we loose your riches, <coughs> glory, honor, provision, and plenty on earth in our nation. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. We give you all the praise. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen. <clears throat> Saints, the church is not a social club. We don't pray just because it's a fun thing to do together. We pray in order to righteously govern. Prayer is so crucially important. You are called to legislate in the spirit realm. As believers, you have to know that. Therefore, I do urge you today to take up your gavel and bind unrighteousness of any kind, including this unrighteous beast called inflation. Use your God-given authority and loose God's sovereignty, his help, his prosperity, and his victory into our nation and into our economy today through your words and prayers. Thank you for that. Please remember to do that throughout the week. Now we turn our prayers toward Israel. We know that God's, Israel is the apple of God's eye. Israel is the timepiece for the whole world. Father, we pray secular Israelis, the religious Orthodox, should hunger and thirst for truth. We ask you to bring those who are searching in contact with believers. We pray for protection and courage for those Muslims trying to find out about your son, Yeshua. We pray for those in positions of responsibility in the military to have all the information they need to make good decisions and also for wisdom to know what is right. 
We pray for this new government to have a sharp conscience for wisdom, for righteousness, and integrity. We pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Psalm 122, 6 says, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. We pray that our Prince of Peace will reveal himself in the hearts of his own brothers and sisters, the Jewish people. Amen. Amen. Father, we pray every prayer today in the name of your son, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior and soon coming King. Thank you for agreeing with me in prayer. Please remember as you see things going on or hear about things going on during the week, to use your God-given authority and pray about it. Also, remember to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That means all of Israel. This is, there's a blessing for it in you, in, in praying for, a blessing for you in praying for Israel. Excuse me. May you be blessed this week and be filled with much shalom. Thank you so much. God bless. And Archbishop is coming with the message. Thank you. We've said it hundreds of times over the years about the blessing for praying for Israel. Maybe if you don't remember, just maybe write a note and clip it to your mirror in the bathroom or maybe on your uh, refrigerator. And it's not a long prayer. We just speak blessing. Lord bless Israel. That's all it needs to take sometimes. I want to share something with you today that um, it's been a couple of years since I talked about this, but since we're in 2023, um, <clears throat> the Lord wants you to be revealed. And by that I mean He wants you to be shown of the power and the glory that you have. Okay. Um, I want to talk to you about treasure. And um, when, when you mention the word treasure, a lot of people sit straight up and listen, and they're intrigued by it. Over the generations, <clears throat> myriads of treasure hunters have uh, emerged and found some treasure and some treasure they didn't find. I remember many, 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 many years ago, we were involved with something like that, and it didn't happen. And then somebody else came along behind us and found the very same thing, some of it, that we were looking for. But one such find happened in uh, 2015. I read this recently. It was a ship called the San Jose, and it was discovered at the bottom of the Caribbean. And history there said that there was over 22 billion, in today's market, $22 billion worth of gold. Oh, better than the lottery. <laughs> Listen to this story of it quickly. The San Jose was traveling from Panama to Columbia, South America, when it went down on June the 8th, 1708, according to history. And during the battle, they were battling with British ships in the war of the Spanish Secession. The British did not manage to take the treasure before the boat went down. And more than 300 years passed until it was finally located at the bottom um, in, near an island, uh, by an unmanned water, uh, underwater vehicle. The treasure has not been recovered yet, even though they found it. And that was in 2015. But all treasure that has not been recovered is still there. And many treasure hunters just keep on and on. The story goes on and on and on. But, but now moving away from that, let's talk about you and I. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul was encouraging the church of Corinth We've talked about it before. It was a new church or young church, and a lot of things were out of order. And some people read part of this, but not the whole story. But Paul was bringing correction, but at the same time, he was bringing instruction and revelation. Second Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have, that we, that's us, we have this treasure, God's glory, His Son, in earthen vessels, so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Now listen to another translation before I get in this. But we have this treasure of light and glory and God Himself in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God, 
not us, but he allows us to be able to flow through this. We are a depository, a depository, I guess is the right word, of treasure, but some of us don't even realize what we have. And you can serve the Lord for 50 years and still never really discover what it is that he's deposited on the inside of us. Over and over and over and over, we, we sometimes forget this. I read a story recently about Billy Graham, <clears throat> Dr. Billy Graham, incredible man of God. And uh, when he was 87 years old, this is obviously before his death, he was coming in from one of his meetings, one of his last crusades, and flew into Asheville, North Carolina, and a limousine was waiting on him. And there was just one man driving the limousine. And he told the limousine driver, he said, young man, I'm 87 years old. I've been all over this world. I've preached to millions of people. He said, but there's one thing I've never done. And the driver said, what? He said, that's drive a limousine. He said, could I drive this limousine? He said, sure. So the driver got in the back and Dr. Graham got in the front of this long limousine and took off down the highway. And he was going 70 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone. And there was a young trooper that was a rookie. He had just started the job not many months earlier. And he saw the limousine fly by him. And he ran it down, turned the lights on, and Dr. Graham pulled over. And the young man looked in the window and recognized him. And he said, excuse me, sir. He went back and got on the radio and called his supervisor. And he said, I I've heard that we are to give, we can give special courtesy to very important people. And I've just stopped a very important person. And the, the headquarters said, uh, well, was it the police commissioner? He said, no, somebody bigger than that. He said, was it the mayor? He said, no, it's somebody greater than that. He said, was it the governor? He said, no, somebody greater than that, even greater than the president. And he said, who was it? He said, it had to be Jesus because Billy Graham was driving the limousine. <laughs> Now, the point of all that is this, the gifting that God had placed in Dr. Graham, he imparted that to millions and millions of people. Now, over the years, <clears throat> I've to continued to discover personally, after 56 years of ministry, more and more talents that I still have in me that's not being used. And, and, and trying to develop them sometimes seems a little more difficult than it was 56 years ago when I started in ministry. But there's talents and gifts residing in each and every one of us. We've talked about this before. They're waiting to be released. They're waiting to be unpacked. They're waiting to be put to work. These gifts, the gifts of God. Now, it's not just He Himself. It's not just Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. But all that God is capable of doing and being, He has given us access to that. Now, that happened, that's what happiness and contentment comes from. But listen, <clears throat> looking at some of the gifts, and I, I've said this before, looking at a brief history, sometimes you just don't realize what you have. I remember some years ago that we came up with an idea of a certain thing, I won't mention it out, but uh, we, we came up with this idea, we got a temporary patent for it, and there was a couple of the, the things, maybe three of them that were built, and it was a absolutely could have been a million dollar venture. But situations begin to rise here and there about being able to build them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually we just kind of quit. Now I found this out a few years later that the Amish people from Pennsylvania got a hold of this somehow, tweaked it a little bit from what our uh, temporary patent was, and they're making millions on it. I and others would be millionaires now. Now, what, what am I saying? You don't give up just because things don't work out all of a sudden. You continue on. You might be thinking, well, at my age, what is there left to do? You could live as long as God allows you to live. You're not leaving till He says it's time for you to go. But with Methuselah, how old was Methuselah? What, 900 years old? Oh, I don't want to live that long. <laughs> Moses, look at what he did at 80 years old. He went in the wilderness for 40 years leading God's people out. Noah, for 120 years, was building the ark. My point is this. Age has nothing to do with the gifts that God's placed on the inside of us. 
In 3500 BC, one of the greatest inventions that we still use today, which changed transportation forever, was the wheel. And the man that invented that, I can't pronounce his name in Hebrew, but the man that invented that at that moment was 90 years old. And he invented the wheel. Now someone had the idea, he had the inspiration, and he changed history just by the wheel. The Gutenberg Press, we, we have all of this in our Bible college. The Gutenberg Press uncovered the idea to bring the joy of reading, not only other material, but reading the Bible to ordinary people. And then the printing press for books and news, a treasure that all of the world right now takes for granted. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on. <clears throat> the internal combustion engine. 1680, that far back. It was perfected in 1859. Now, transportation would not be where it is right now had not some ordinary person used the gift of the inspiration or the thought on the inside of them and created something that had never been there before. Now, treasure is defined many ways, but it is the accumulated wealth, as in money or jewels, but it's also something that's hidden and then found. Like I said in a moment ago, you and I are a depository. We are a treasury. We have a United States treasury, and then we have the IRS who does not cooperate with anybody who would control that. But the treasure that God's placed in us is not money, it's not wealth, but it is that that He Himself has designed for us before we were ever even born. Go back to read Jeremiah chapter 1. <clears throat> and God told Jeremiah, the prophet, he was a young prophet, he said, I knew you before I formed you in your mother's womb. And I called you to be a prophet to the nations. And he said, don't be afraid of their faces. Verse 12, he said, I will run to perform my word. I'll hasten to perform it. Now what he was trying to get across to Jeremiah, he was going to face some things, but God had already created the gift to be a prophet on the inside of it. Now treasure, treasury, again, is a place where things are stored. On and on and on, the list goes on. Let me give you just a couple of more. Three vaccines for measles, mumps, and polio. They were created. Somebody got the idea and create. it was a gift. Now, I don't know the ages, but again, let me emphasize. How can we just go through life mundanely living and never really reach out to accomplish something? You might say, well, I've raised my family. That's good. And, and my family members are successful, that's good. But what have you done? The gifts that God has placed on the inside of you in 2023, He wants these things released so that other people are blessed by your activity, by the treasure on the inside of you. Thank God for Henry Ford. <laughs> Thank God for Thomas Edison. <laughs> Thank God for the Wright brothers. You know, if they, I, we've heard this phrase before, it's not real. <laughs> but if Henry could turn over, and he would turn over in his grave if he saw transportation today. The Wright brothers would probably sit up in their grave. Could they see what has happened by the invention they had? They were two sons of a minister. They were working in a bicycle shop. And they came up with the idea that man can fly. But people all around said it'll never happen. But now look what's taking place. Because of the gift on the inside. They were called to minister, but they discovered there was the ability to do something that would change people's lives. Now, <clears throat> let me just, this little thing here. And I talked about this a while back <clears throat> for quite a while. The paper clip. <laughs> It is so insignificant. One little piece of wire, they come in different sizes. In 1899, someone came up with this idea. It was a gift on the inside. They actually saw this thing. And how could we make things a little easier to keep papers together? It became a multi, and still is, multi-billion dollar thing that goes on in business just because of one little thing. Now, my point is this. How do you know at your age right now that one little thought put together, one little thought 
uh, accomplished or one little, one little thought put into practice would not change somebody's life and change what's going on in our world. See, he wants us to change what's going on in America. He wants us to change what's going on in the world. But you've got to realize, again, you are a depository. You know, I, I'm a depository. I would like to deposit all the money that I can gather. I am really upset that person, she was an elderly lady, I think, that won that $1.5 billion lottery. Now, you know, when you read the lottery, now don't turn me off because you think I'm gambling, but, but you think about this, that what they said, this person was going to have it over a 30-year period. At her age, at my age... <laughs> I won't live another 30 years. I'd take it all at once. And then the government gets half and I get the other half. And then the IRS gets the other part, but I would still have it. But my point is this. That would be something in me that I could do things that I've never been able to do before. It's been prophesied to me for years and years and years in a large church meeting that maybe I was not ministering, sitting in the back, and somebody would call me up and said, the Lord just said it's going to take millions of dollars for you to do what I've called you to do. And I'd say, yay, yes, sir, amen. Year by year by year, but it went by and I never became a millionaire. But I still have that, first of all, that prophecy, but there's still some gifts on the inside of me that have not been released and have not been developed yet, and I'm believing that's going to happen before the Lord calls me home. Hallelujah. Now listen. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. Anybody read that scripture, what David said? Psalms 139, 14. David, King David said, I will praise you, O Lord, for I am fearfully, the word there means amazing and incredibly. <laughs> I am fearfully, amazingly, incredibly and wonderfully made. Now, David has given a statement that, that sounds <laughs> way out for himself. See, the human body that God made is not just a human body. We are extraordinary. We know that. I'm an extraordinary person. Okay. I have an extraordinary personality. <laughs> I have an extraordinary desire to do the things that you say. Boy, you're really bragging on yourself. No, God brags on me. And he says the same thing about you, regardless of your age, regardless of what you're going through, regardless of what you've had to put up with. He says you are incredibly, wonderfully made. You know, science always is trying to create, well, what is it called, cryonics? You know, they freeze your body and hopefully one day they're going to raise you up. What they've not stopped to think about, the sign is that everybody is going to rise from the dead, regardless of whether or not even the sea will give up the dead, and we're going to stand before the judgment seat of God, the white throne judgment. But the point is this, when the Lord made us, it was not mass production, but individually he handcrafted us. He handcrafted and molded us. God, Elohim, creator, he, he, he made the body to heal itself. Now, if we eat right, which is hard today with all the food that's pushed at us, <laughs> But in the days of old, in ancient days, people ate differently than what they eat today. And they ate healthily. But, but think about this. The way God's designed the body, you know this, but if you get a cut, now you, you mean obviously you, you want to put some kind of medication on it to keep infection out, but just what you do doesn't necessarily heal it. That body, your body heals that cut from the inside. You follow what I'm saying? And this is the way God designed this body to be. Listen to this. Your brain, <laughs> some people's brain, can store 100 trillion facts. Whew. Can you? I can't even count that high. It's a proven fact. It's an incredible creation. Your mind, now this varies... <laughs> can handle 5,000 to 10,000 decisions in less than a minute if needed. I, I can't fathom that, but scientists have proved it. Your nose can smell 10,000 different odors, depending on how large the nose is, I guess. Your touch, now listen to this, can detect an item 125th one twenty-five thousandths of an inch thick. 
That's how intricate God made. Your tongue can taste one part of quinine and one million parts of water. See, we are an incredibly made, habilitated treasury and depository of all that God is capable of giving us. But what are we doing with it? Maybe some of you are watching, listening to this, say, you know, this is just a lot of, a lot of facts. It is, but it's real. If you're born again in spirit feel, God made you a depository. He made you a treasury. He didn't just make you a treasure. He made you a treasury of all these things that should be able to rise up and bless other people's lives. Now, you may not go on to create something great that changes the world, but your gift, the gift that God has given you of life, and if you're born again in spirit filled, the nine gifts of the spirit in Ephesians or Second Corinthians excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is available, and each one of those gifts can be used not for your benefit, but for someone else's benefit. Hallelujah. Now, one of the most common excuses that people give is, um, I just don't have any abilities to offer or any talents. Or because of my domestic situation and my family situation, I, I just can't do what I'd like to do. But how long are you going to let something keep you from being fulfilled like God has given you birth for and the reason? Hundreds and hundreds of untapped abilities reside in us. One study was done recently, and I read this again uh, a while back, but that the average person, if you consider yourself average, I don't, I don't like that word. Average is the best, the worst, the worst, the best. But I, I, I see the, you being the best. But studies have revealed that the average person, average Joe, average, average Jane, possesses from 500 to 700 different skills and abilities, far more than what they realize. 500 to 700 different skills. <laughs> if I list mine on the paper, I don't even come close. But they're still there, and they can be uh, resurrected. They can be released. Now, you were born an original, refused to die a copy. One thing I try not to do <clears throat> in ministry is to try to be like somebody else. I have ministered by the grace of God to thousands. Thousands in one service. I've sat with royalty. I've sat with presidents. I've sat with all kinds of people, God's greatest generals in, a, in America and in the world, the generals of the gospel of what I'm talking about. But I've always been who I am and what I am. But I realize every time I'm in the presence of someone like that, that it can trigger something on the inside of me by watching what they're doing and how they're doing it, that now this gift that has just been sitting dormant there can now rise up and come alive. But what are you going to do with the gifts that are in you? Are you going to unpack them? Jesus, in Matthew chapter 13, <clears throat> he was talking about hidden treasure. He was talking about giftings. In Matthew 13, verse 45, 44 through 45, and then verse 52. Let me just give you a brief of it. The kingdom of heaven is like something precious buried in a field which a man found and hid it again, then sells all that he has, and he buys the field. The kingdom is like the man who is a dealer in search of precious pearls, who on finding one single pearl of great price, sold all that he had and bought it. Jesus was giving an illustration of the gifts, but then it's buried. And if you remember, over in the, over in the book of Matthew as well, <clears throat> Jesus talked about the man that committed the talents to his servants and went away on a trip. And the one that had, he gave five talents to multiplied it, and it was ten. And the one that he gave the ten to, it multiplied to ten more. And he gave the third man one talent. And if you remember the story, that man hid it because he was afraid that he might lose it. So once again, how many gifts, how many treasures in your life are you allowing to be used? Is it a family situation that's stopping it? 
Is it a physical situation that's stopping it? See, just because family gets in the way, just because a physical infirmity comes, that doesn't mean that God said, well, you're no good with that. I'll give that gift to somebody else. He plants and deposits it on the inside of us so that it can be used to change a person's life. Isaiah 1.19, I believe it is. Isaiah said, if you be willing and obedient, you'll eat the good of the land. What he was talking about is because of the gift that God has placed on the inside of you, that all the good that you have access to, it will come and be yours. Now, we're born with talents, we're born with gifts, but once again, how many have we unpacked? Listen to this in Isaiah 61. I'm almost finished. Verse 3. He's appointed unto them that mourn in Zion to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, that's a gift, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they might be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that He might be glorified. I've said this many, many times. I think I've told our group this, but I meet people all the time. Bless their dear hearts. They're bucket Christians. They get dissatisfied with something going on here and they move over here. They get dissatisfied with something going on here and they move over here. But it seems like everybody's wrong but them. You ever met somebody like that? They move from place to place, place. But Isaiah said, we're the planting of the Lord. Grow where you're planted that He might be glorified. Grow where He's placed you. Use the gift that He's given you. Now, we, we lately, for a, a long time, we've not made room probably in our services of being on Facebook uh, all this time for the gifts of the Spirit to operate. But that's going to change. Free in 2023, as we said. But see, what God wants to do with us is to unpack every day something else, something new that you've not experienced, which is going to help somebody else's life. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the nine gifts of the Spirit. And I've heard this taught different ways, but I I believe I understand the, the principle of it. We can operate in all nine gifts, but not at the same time. But every person is given one of the gifts when they're baptized in the Holy Spirit, as Paul said. And these gifts are to edify the church. It's to change somebody's life, not yours. The gift of prophecy, the gift of the, there are three gifts that speak, there are three gifts that reveal, and the three gifts of power. The working of miracles, the gift of faith, and the working of signs, wonders, and miracles. And then diverse kind of tongues, prophecy, and interpretation of tongues. And then the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge and discerning the Spirit again. Now, what Paul was trying to say to the church, God has made this available that it edifies the church whenever someone is using one of these gifts. Now, um, uh, this used to happen, and I believe it will happen again, but many times I've been in a restaurant eating and the Lord would speak to me about uh, a waitress or even a waiter. And I would just calmly say, um, I'm a minister, and can I just share something with you? They say, sure. And just a brief word, not my God said, and jump up Pentecostal and go nuts, but just give them a special word, and it's changed their lives. I've sat in restaurants, and <clears throat> sometimes I've tried to resist this, but I was in, uh, <clears throat> I was in Georgia, some time ago, and I went to a restaurant beside the hotel, and um, I didn't tell anybody about this, but there was a group of 12 people that were sitting at a table. And they, you, you could tell they're church people. They just got out of church. I was coming through there on Sunday night, and the Holy Spirit said, pay for their meal. <laughs> and my first thought was, you pay for it. Because <laughs> I'm looking at all these people. They're no children. It's all adults. And they were eating heartily if you know what I mean. And I I, I picked up my phone and looked in the account, how much do I have? Anyway, when I was leaving, I didn't do this so they could come over and say, oh, thank you so much. But as I was leaving, I told the waiter that as I was checking out, I said, I want to put their bill on my bill. He said, you're not serious. I said, yes, I am. I want to pay for all of those meals. He said, do you know how much it was? I said, no, 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 no. Don't even tell me. Just put it on my card. Well, I got outside. I was getting in my truck, and one man ran out, and he said, you would not believe 
how God led you. He said, we were counting up how much we had and we didn't have enough to pay for our meals and we didn't want to wash dishes. <laughs> now, I won't tell you how much that was, but when I got to the church where I was ministering, the Lord gave me probably 10 times of what I received or what I've spent on those people. My point again, it was a treasury on the inside of me and the gift of giving. And so I had no problem doing it. Now, this year, I'm closing this. This year, God's going to cause us to leap, take a leap forward beyond where we've been. Everyone's not called to be an apostle. Everyone's not called to be a prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher from Ephesians 4. Everyone's not called to a pulpit ministry, but every believer has a calling of their life. What are you going to do with the gift? Discover the gift. If you discover it and you don't know how to release it, you don't know how to, how to make it work, that's what we're here for. We'll help you do that. But see, God will use you regardless of what's going on. But I believe this year, stronger than previous years. We can't let family distract us. We can't let sickness distract us. We can't let the economy distract us. As Dr. Patricia is praying against the uh, recession, amen, Declare it every day that God delights in the prosperity of his servants. But every situation that can, the enemy will set it up to stop you from being effective with the gift that you have on the inside of you. Maybe you're just called to be a prayer warrior and not just pray little minor prayers, but I mean spend hours. I know people that spend hours in prayer, praying over situations. It's a gift. It's a treasure which changes people's lives. But every one of us have a talent. Every one of us have a gift. And God wants it to work even this year. Well, I'm going to share this with you some more at another time. But think about this. Moses felt inferior. Gideon said, I'm, I'm the least in my father's house. Matthew was a tax collector, hated by the, by the public. Peter was a fisherman, had a hot temper. A myriad of others, but they discovered the gift in their life. And that gift was used and it changed multitudes. Same thing for you that are watching. Now, perhaps you don't know Jesus. Oh, you know about him. You know, not everybody that says they know him, know him well. They know about him. We hear about him. I've talked to atheists who said, I don't believe in God, yet they use God's name in a terrible way. They don't believe in Jesus, yet they use his name. But listen, perhaps you've never given your life to him. It's not hard. We're not asking you to join a church by no means, but all you have to say is, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and make me a believer. And He'll change you, I promise you. Perhaps you've gotten away from Him. Maybe you've strayed because of situations happened in your life, maybe in your marriage, maybe in your health or your finances, and you just got discouraged. You say, I, I just can't take this anymore. You don't have to start all over again. Just start where you stopped and continue on, and God will change it. Well, God bless you. Uh, I pray that you will be blessed this week and next week. We're going to be in a, in a subject, I believe, dealing with 2023 that's going to challenge all of us. Have a blessed day. Amen.